big welcome to all of you. So before um, before I introduce Kieran, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about Social Design Sydney and also wanted to share um, something a little bit personal that I've been working on as well. So a lot of you have, well, a lot of you who have signed up, there's a few of you here who, I, who I've seen at Social Design Sydney over the years. Um, it began in 2013, which is a really, really long time ago. We were first hosted by um, UNSW um, Art and Design, which is which by back then was called COFA. And then generously UTS offered us a home for a while at Dirk, the Design Innovation Research Centre. And that's actually where I first met Kieran. And I, I know I've seen quite a few of you have come to had come to events at Dirk over the years. Um, during COVID, we moved Social Design Sydney online, which was also really great because it opened it up to new audiences from other places. Over the years, Social Design Sydney has hosted many, many events. We've had a lot of practitioners come and share stories about design and social, um, social change doing. And all of these talks are hosted on the Social Design Sydney website. So if you'd like to um, have a look and learn and from other practitioners over the years, have a look there because there's lots of videos and there's a YouTube channel as well. So this video will be added to, the, to that collection of, um, of stories and tales of design doing. And um, you can refer it, you know, refer your friends to it later who haven't been able to make it today. Um, also, Social Design Sydney does offer some training. I'm currently running a, trainer, a training in trauma-informed design research, and I've been doing for a, a few years. And if that's of something of interest, please do come along. I've got a new training at looking at um, how might we navigate distress as well. So that's a new offering. There's an e-newsletter that you can sign up to on the Social Design Sydney website to hear more about um, events that are coming up. And also I put a lot of resources relating to social design and systems change um, when, when, I, when I share these. So this is a really old slide, but I'm gonna read it here. So Social Design Sydney aims to build a social design community of practice to support social and systems change, to link designers and the social change sector, share stories of social design and systems change doing, and build design and social change capability. Um, also, if you don't want to sign up, you feel free to follow me on LinkedIn and I, I post what, what's happening there. I wanted to take this opportunity today to share a little bit about what I've been up to recently and in, to introduce a new initiative to you. During COVID, my husband and I moved to Jarvis Bay on Newham Country, which is about two and a half um, hours south of Sydney. And I'd like to introduce you to my pond. This is my pond. And this is the place that I ponder. Here I sit and I think about the state of the world. I think about what's needed and I think about what is mine to do. We are living in challenging, in challenging and changing times. I'm sure you will agree. And I'm feeling concerned. I feel to steward in the change we want in the world right now, we need to be, see, sense, think, relate, and act differently. Through cultivating deeper awareness of self, each other, our places, and our living world, we are better placed to reimagine and actualize a flourishing living world for all of life. Inner development can help us to cultivate the creativity, the resilience, the systemic awareness and relational capacity needed to bring in a better future. I would like to introduce you to a new initiative I've been working on with my colleague Vivian Sung, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, called the School of Being. We aim to restore well-being within ourselves, our relations, our places, our places, and our living world. We are a learning community. We host experiential learning journeys aiming to help people grow inner capacity for increased presence, increased sensing capacity, response ability, resilience, and creativity, so that we can together co-create a flourishing world. This weekend, I'm very excited that right in front of this pond, we will be hosting our first retreat on my land. Our approaches are informed by somatic, creative, nature-based and regenerative, regenerative approaches, as we believe that these practices can support the inner changes required for individual and collective transformation. We are passionate about both inner and outer change. 
as designers, we were very focused on focused on outer change, but we both really feel that inner development is a really important key for transitions and this time. Tomorrow, we are we are hosting a listening circle. We hosted a circle a few weeks ago um, for designers where we were looking at um, the discipline of design, but this listening circle is more generally for change makers. Um, here, we will consider the state of things in our work and in the world. What do we need to flourish? And how might we become more resilient so that we can meet systemic challenges? So if you're free and feel like popping along, please do come along. Also from June, the School of Being will be running a 10 week experiential um, learning journey. We would love to see you there. We'll be looking at how to cultivate new ways of being where we will draw on lots of diverse practices. We'll um, introduce a practice. You'll have some kind of homework or home play and then we'll come back to the group and reflect. So it's a it's a it's a doing journey where we are learning new ways of how to cultivate new ways of being with some new different sorts of somatic and regenerative embodied practices. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Kieran. I'll just read his bio for a moment. So Kieran is a systemic designer, making maker, and activist with ten years of co-design experience on Gadigal country primarily focused on regenerative transitions. They are currently fi finishing up their PhD. I believe um, Kieran submitted three weeks ago. So big congrats, so congratulations to him for that big step, yay. Um, and continuing to work with Regen Sydney and Coalition of Everyone using design-led approaches to bring coherence to action across sectors and scales. So I do ask, feel free to use the chat for um, back channel of banter. But please do save your questions um, for the end and Kieran will respond once he's finished his, his presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and thank you so much to Kieran. I'm really excited to, um, to hear from you. We've been talking about you um, sharing for some time, so I'm glad it's finally here. So over to you, Kieran. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jax, um, for the wonderful intro. And um, yeah, I'm stoked at all these beautiful faces. Some just downstairs, down the road, up and down the coast, and maybe some people in the seats as well. But um, yeah, really happy to to be here and be here with you. Uh -oh. I'll just share my Can screen now. Karen? And um, I'll be talking through my doctoral research um, and reflecting on the findings around systemic design practice. Uh, and as you can see, the title of my research is having some tech difficulties. It's back now. Hopefully that's the last time. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, my, the title of my research is Designing for Earth Democracy Transitions, Processes to Foster an Economics of Radical Interdependence. There's a lot of jargony words in there and hopefully this kind of becomes a bit clearer as we go on today. Uh, but yeah, I'll start with an acknowledgement of country as well. I'm calling in from Balanaming, uh, lands of the Gadigal people. Uh, with my friends downstairs and around me, Paula. Um, I think we'd all like to pay our respects to elders past and present and acknowledge the sovereignty of this land was never ceded. I'm so grateful for the, the beautiful land, waters, skies and spirits that lets us build community here and not only live but thrive. Um, and in that moment, in that sentiment, I also want to just take a moment to pay heed to the plight of the Palestinian people who are facing brutal horrors and having their lives and sovereignty ripped away from them as we speak. And our representatives in government continuing to play geopolitics with their settler colonial friends. Uh, and what I'm about to present to you isn't a response to that unfolding genocide, but I would like to acknowledge that the geopolitical neo-colonial dynamics at play in Palestine, as well as with First Nations sovereignty at home, are also evident in regenerative transitions. Um, so no zero sum solution is gonna provide lasting relief, but rather we must find nuanced ways of navigating larger than life tensions together. So this is what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll go through some of the con concepts that underpin my research and then what the form of that research was uh, and then spend most of the time on some of the findings and implications um, for design practice 
And I do want to acknowledge as well while we're here just the different levels of expertise that might be amongst us in the room today. So I'll seek to speak a language that is valuable across that spectrum. Um, some of it might be technical, um, but yeah, let's have a chat afterwards and if you know and and after the session too, if you're interested. My background has played a, a large role in shaping the position I take in my professional practice, as well as in my research. And from the time at the Design Innovation Research Centre, it's been very abundantly clear to me about the importance of acknowledging my subjective positionality as someone working in contested collaborative forums. And so in that respect, I, I come to this research with my Tamil heritage, my upbringing in the inner West, moulding me in a particular version of multicultural Australia, um, an ongoing uh, search for what it means to be an ally walking with First Nations people, and an ongoing unpacking of essential list, essentialist worldviews with my non-binary agenda. Um, and then professionally with the Design Innovation Research Centre, I was really impressed upon me um, the value of collaborative design as a tool to respond to systems complexity. And so my doctoral research looked to build upon this um, from largely social justice focus areas at the Design Innovation Research Centre to, towards the field of regenerative economics and governance. And so these explorations of design-led system level transitions led me to engage with Regen Sydney and Coalition of Everyone, um, a few of team members here today with us. And they have formed an integral part of my doctoral research, but also my ongoing um, professional practice now that I'm supposedly free. Um, you might remember from a few years ago, this image. And so I just want to come back to the context really briefly. What is the nature of our current state of affairs? When I first started this thesis four, four and a bit years ago, this image was doing the rounds online and I started the research literally two days after the first COVID lockdown was announced and people were trying to make sense of what resilience would mean in the face of global shocks. Um, and then this image attempting to con contextualize the kind of short-sighted nature of uh, fear um, that was permeating our society at the time. Um, and it did seem at first that the pandemic would be a crucible through which we could spur on greater action towards social and ecological well-being. But as we now see and are experiencing, there's so many aspects of our world that have further destabilized. Um, and so I would, I'd say that the intractable nature of these crises really require fundamental transformations of human activity, both inner and outer, like Jacks was saying, uh, the external structures, but also our internal worldviews. There are some key systemic shifts that could help us see meaningful action in response to those interconnected crises. Uh, and here I depict three of them and the confluence of which formed my research focus. So first in orange on the left from a human nature separation to an earth-centered interconnectedness, also known as ecocentrism. Um, secondly, in green, uh, from a neoliberal globalized economy to regenerative economies localized. And then in yellow, in terms of power, monopolized power and deregulated markets, a shift to the commons with distributed power and collaborative governance. So the literature review helped me to unpack some of that and form a conceptual foundation, and as well as to help in contextualizing my field research. And you might be wondering, what is Earth democracy? Um, for me, it was a really foundational concept. Vandana Shiva, who's a food sovereignty activist, um, describes it as local scale democracies with local communities organized on principles of inclusion, diversity, 
and driven by ecological and social responsibility. And in her book, she outlines 10 principles for the concept, which have acted as a, a guiding manifesto for my research, as well as more broadly as a, a North Star vision for the types of worldviews, social practices, and societal structures that would enable such a paradigm shift. Over the four years, I was particularly drawn and uh, towards these authors, which I've mapped out. Um, across different themes and the theoretical frameworks that they contributed. Uh, these aren't all the authors that have made it into my thesis, of course, but um, some of the key ones that helped to form a complementary foundation upon which um, my field of research was founded. And so I'll just talk um, briefly about a couple of these. So the first one is pluriversalism, uh, which many of you might have heard about already, um, but this suggests that we need to resituate human activity in the context of our intersubjective and interconnection with non-human worlds. And so the diagram there kind of depicts the shift from universality, this idea of a one world world towards pluriversality, a many world world. And in doing this, a call to consider not only the agency of us as humans, but also of the different interlapping, overlapping non-human worlds that exist. And in doing this, blur the boundaries of separation and help to form reciprocal relationships with the rest of the Earth community. And this spirit of mutually engaged relationality is beautifully captured in the Zapatista call. Um, where they phrase it, a world where many worlds fit. So a question here is, can multi-stakeholder design help to cultivate active custodianship of the quality of relationality that exists between humans and non-humans? And with the recognition that all of the Earth community has intrinsic value, how can the non-human world be given voice in human design processes? The next concept I want to um, introduce or highlight is degrowth. And so this diagram depicts what the trajectory of a degrowth transition could look like in the global north context in particular. And degrowth as a concept itself continues to play a vital role in agitating societies or global north societies' insane addiction to endless growth economics. And with this diagram, I, I attempt to reconcile the donut economics framework with degrowth. And you'll see donut economics mentioned down the bottom right on the x-axis there. The role of a guiding compass can't be overstated. And we can see that in the way that the GDP metric is, is so culturally and institutionally embedded in our prevailing economic systems. And in this way, the donut economics framework could be seen as a means to an end, as a guiding compass, using its holistic framework in helping to degrow global north economies, which have already overshot over planetary boundaries. Um, one last diagram in this section, uh, which captures a couple different concepts together. In particular, I'm looking at bioregionalism, participatory governance, economic localization, and, and distributed production. And um, in my literature review, trying to make sense of those concepts in relationship with one another and how the, the different cultural, economic, political and social material movements which they represent um, interact with one another. So there is a growing movement towards bioregionalism and calls to, to grow this, uh, which it would, entire, it, it would entail a renewed emphasis on living in reciprocity with our local places and the qualities of those ecosystems their biogeophysical realities. And often there's a huge correlation there with the First Nations language groups that exist in this continent and the 89 bioregions and sub bioregions that the government has defined. But in my literature review, um, I found that there was actually a great deal of synergy also between distributed forms of economics and governance captured by two particular concepts uh, or frameworks, cosmopolitan localism and polycentricity. So both of these advocate for distributed and nested 
forms of economics and governance, respectively, um, with a preference for fit-for-purpose, place-based organisation. And there's a synergy between bioregionalism and those two concepts. So that was coming into my articulation of my field research as well. Apart from the literature review, a project at Dirk with New South Wales Circular was also quite formative for my um, research design. And this was held in 2021 and focused on exploring how the circular economy could be grounded in a citizen-led and place-based model, um, which is quite a departure from prevailing approaches to the circular economy, which are heavily skewed towards technocentric and supply chain solutions. The explorations of qualities of participants' bioregions and the impacts of current production and consumption practices led to a reframed understanding of the circular economy through the lens of care. And the First Nations perspectives in the room were invaluable to this endeavour and it pushed other participants to reevaluate their assumptions. Through this project, I gained a stronger sense of the need for extended collaboration as it was quite a short piece. And to move beyond ideas of circularity towards holistic social and ecological well-being. And so my research design evolved with these insights and I sought to study ongoing design-led systems convening rather than focusing on isolated instances of co-design. So now my research design. When I began this doctorate, my focus was more on the, on the material, enabling self-sufficient cities, looking at material flows, learning from key eco-village precedents. Though that shifted as I quickly realised that there's no blueprint that exists to achieve such a thing. It was only through context-specific collaboration that social and ecological dynamics could be interrogated. And as I continued further on, on, the, on my field of research, I moved from a focus on specific instances of co-design, as I mentioned with the Circular Project, to study longer-term systemic processes including the different ways in which coalitions of diverse actors could be convened towards um, shared missions. And these are my research questions. Um, so the, first, the, the high level one is what kinds of design best foster system level transitions to bioregionally adapted regenerative economies, which is a mouthful. Um, and then the subsequent questions are looking at the process of, of convening as well as the ways in which ecological um, thresholds and needs can be met. So in, in the research, um, this was the, uh, I suppose, framework that I used as the paradigm, the philosophy, methodology and methods. Um, I went with a post-constructivist philosophy, uh, which basically holds that meaning is socially constructed, but in concert with material reality. Um, I and, and this moves past the dichotomy that is often held between social constructivism and realism, as in between socially con constructed meaning and objective reality, but it, seeks to move beyond that dichotomy and see, see value in both qualitative and quantitative approaches. And with, with that philosophy, I used a critical design ethnography methodology. And so this is a form of participatory research uh, that allowed me to reflexively interrogate the design practice that um, took place across the two um, sites of research, which I'll talk, which I'll talk about now. Um, so the two sites, as I mentioned earlier, Regen Sydney and Coalition of Everyone, um, operate in quite a distinct yet complementary manner. They're both oriented towards regenerative transitions. Um, Regen Sydney is focused on greater Sydney context and looking at fostering regenerative economics, primarily using the donut economics framework for the moment. And Coalition of Everyone on on the other hand, is focused on developing bioregional governance, um, harnessing a place-based resourcing model. 
So I've been intimately involved with both organizations um, as a team member, convener, um, and then during my research as a uh, insider researcher. Um, and there continues to be a huge level of trust between myself and the team members. And I'm so grateful for all of you who are here and who aren't here today for being a part of the research and um, definitely helped to shape the research and findings. And I hope you hear all the colleagues' voices coming through um, as I go through this and if you read the thesis as well. Across the two sites, um, I wanted to tell the story of what systems level design practice is, could be, looks like, opportunities and challenges. And to do this, I had an extended nine months of participant observation. And the key milestones are highlighted there on the right. After the period of participant observation, I had uh, a series of interviews as well that helped to test and validate some of the findings. And I suppose overall, my interest in systems level design in these contexts included their convening function, bringing coherence across diverse alliances and stakeholders. And as you can see in the milestones, there's heaps of different co-design sessions, workshops, roundtables, public events, and internal strategy development. Um, that was the focus of my research there. So now I'll talk about some of the findings, and I hope that as I go through this bit, you can see the importance of visual sense making as well uh, to my practice, as well as to the practice of um, my colleagues in the two sites as well. So there's an overview of the finding themes, um, a lot more detail in the in, in the thesis. Uh, this is, these are some umbrella areas of concern that emerged out of the analysis of the data that I collected, um, which included, you know, transcripts, notes, diagrams, the interviews and so on. But I'll go through most of these in the slides after this. And so there's the ontological orientation of the individual designer. There's the collective prefigurative practice of the organization in question. There's systems convening, how you bring projects together as a, link, uh, a set of linked um, portfolio towards a mission. Uh, there's ways to ground it in place and the types of engagement and co-design processes that help with that. There's the need to work across different scales in order to make sense of the system's complexity, um, drawing from different transition theories and developing theories of change, uh, the, the role of qualitative and quantitative data in order to guide regenerative transitions and having living prototypes and demonstrators that could bring the value of projects to the wider community and act as a crucible through it to test processes and new assemblages of governance and economics as well. Um, and systemic investing, which is uh, a challenge I'll come to later as well, a response to a challenge. So first, prefigurative politics. Uh, fostering mutually reciprocal relationships with partners has been a key part of the prefigurative practice of both organizations. The organizing teams have found it hugely important to embody the relational cultures that they seek to bring into being through the work itself. And during the time of formation, um, there were connections on both teams uh, with Extinction Rebellion and the Transition Towns movement. Um, and that has pl played a part initially in orienting the organizations towards not only seeking collaborative interventions, but to actually collectively embody the socio cultures of systemic change that are being sought. And in this vein, Regen Sydney conducted regenerative cultures workshops within the core team um, with the acknowledgement to of needing to grow personally in tandem with collective contributions. And this has, I suppose, encouraged and encouraged us to grow an integrated approach so that it's not just cognitive, but also bringing in emotive and embodied connections to change practices. 
and the guiding principles shown there reflect those underpinning motivations. Um, Coalition of Everyone similarly embodied a regenerative orientation in its organizational culture. Um, notably, early this uh, early this year, no, it was last year, sorry, um, their nature was included as a stakeholder in the discussions with First Nations advisor, Professor Yin Paradis, representing water in the in the board meeting and attempting to test how the team could make better earth-centered decisions for organizational operations. And all in all, these ways of being have permeated both the internal and external engagements and have needed protection uh, from co-option by the dominant um, social and political regime. Moving on to the theories of change, um, this is an attempt by both organisations to articulate how they seek to navigate um, systemic leverage points and enact change through their programs of work. And some of the characteristics that could help to make these such a thing valuable is an articulation of the long-term impact with respect to also the team skill sets and fields of expertise, understanding the transformative potential of the work, um, as well as the framing of short to midterm deliverables that feed into multi-stage engagements. Um, and of course, having an evocative representation of the values and culture of the collective in question can really help to um, bring a theory of change to life, visual language as well. And I wouldn't say that all of these characteristics were successfully met, but um, they continue to be worked towards. Um, and Regen Sydney's work is anchored in the donut economics framework. Um, although not completely defined by it. And this is apparent in the visual language there as well. And like I mentioned just earlier, the embodiment and mindfulness activities to break out of a purely cognitive approach was really important to the theory change process with Regen Sydney um, helping to ground the team. Um, with Coalition of Everyone, there's been a strong culture of embracing emergence and this manifested not only in client-facing sessions, but also more deeply with um, strategic objectives and network weaving. Um, the emergent approach was sometimes a double-edged sword in that on the one hand, it at this period of creating this theory of change allowed for agility in articulating a response to systemic funding shortages and blockages, uh, which also meant there was a shortage of uh, team resources towards the established focus areas, um, which has evolved since then as well. Um, but at the time, the theory of change uh, was somewhat linear and diffuse and needing more work since then. Um, on reflection, I find that an iterative inward and outward process uh, in creating a, a theory of change and in developing strategy was was more suited to the formative stages um, of these two organizations, um, which might be quite characteristically different as the organizations grow. Uh, with the multi-level perspective framework, which is a, a transition theory framework, um, Bridge and Sydney conducted deep abductive sense-making and this helped to identify uh, systemic opportunity areas as well as to consolidate and detail uh, what was identified in the theory of change. Um, so the team, when we were going through this process, looked to interrogate this detailed view of the transformation ecosystem and the countless cross-sector entanglements that were articulated. By going through this process, the team not only identified priority areas for action, um, but also to make distinctions regarding the viability for tangible impact at different leverage points at the different levels you see there. Um, essentially, that meant that some opportunity areas across the cultural, institutional, experimental and behavioural domains were deemed as more feasible. And although the framework was um, daunting at first, uh, the process of synthesis um, and the insights that came out of it was found to be 
extremely valuable. Uh, and I, I initially did find um, the framework lacking due to its emission explicit consideration of ecological system dynamics, but the orientation of Regen Sydney and the team towards regenerative transition was able to compensate for that. And similar to the MLP at Regen Sydney, the Three Horizons framework proved to be a valuable analytical tool at Coalition of Everyone. Uh, the team there was, was faced with the task of grappling with structural challenges in trying to expand the focus of participatory governance processes to more meaningfully include consideration of bioregional dynamics. And this is quite a radical proposition to many potential funders. And however much they supported such a mission, um, it wasn't surprising that their financial capital was still wedded to more centralized and technocentric solutions. So with the view of funding as a critical systemic blocker, Coalition of Everyone began developing the Earth Equity Model as a bridging mechanism and a part of that Earth Bank accounts, seeking to create locally pooled funds with contributions from local businesses and corporate donors. And the proposition was to avoid dependence on centralized sources of funding, whether that's governmental, philanthropic, and to decentralize the resourcing needed for place-based governance. In essence, could be called a bioregional bank account. This framework itself isn't geared towards as much of a highly detailed articulation of multi-stage transitions, but it's been hugely valuable in surfacing a coherent organization strategy. Building upon the theories of change and analysis with the MLP and Three Horizons, each organization proceeded to develop and surface a portfolio of projects. These areas of action were distinct in their focus, stakeholder engagement and scales of intervention, uh, but they were, had a shared North Star vision. At Regen Sydney, this included uh, a living lab focused on research and data, neighborhood activations looking to strengthen community resilience and city scale pilots looking to build cross sector demonstrators. And similarly at the time at Coalition of Everyone, participatory assemblies, regen places, sharing knowledge between initiatives and earth equity, as I just mentioned. And both organizations benefited from harnessing Mariana Mazzucato's mission-oriented innovation model, as well as um, other evolutions of that model from Dan Hill and uh, Griffith Center for systems innovation. Ultimately, they sought to create multi-pronged portfolios of projects geared towards shared North Stars. Convening alliances of stakeholders across the various project streams is clearly an integral part of the work at both organizations. This diagram depicts the, the project portfolios of both organizations mapped across different scales, um, as well as on the x-axis, showing how that might feed into one another in fostering their respective multi-stage transitions. They're plotted according to when they might be financially feasible with more radical programs of work plotted further to the right. The green markings show Regen Sydney's projects, um, orange showing Coalition of Everyone, and the shaded areas refer to the range of partnerships and stakeholder alliances to be convened. And it's clear that the role of a systems convener or mission manager um, is crucial to bring coherence across the linked initiatives. Uh, and there's an ongoing question for each of these programs of work in seeking how to best partner with public and private initiatives and institutions in a way to bridge top down and bottom up approaches. I realize I've been racing along, so I'm gonna slow down for a sec. Um, across both sites of research, there's a need to nurture an emerging new politics, ones that one that's attuned to social and ecological qualities. And Bruno Latour's conceptualization of the terrestrial calls for us to re-embed ourselves in the webs of place and not view nature as something external to us. He says, redirecting attention from nature towards the terrestrial 
interconnected place might put an end to the disconnect that has frozen political positions since the appearance of the climate threat, has imperiled the linking of the so-called social struggles with those we call ecological. The Sydney donor is an attempt to capture the spirit of interconnectedness, strengthen a politics of place. A series of workshops and uh, roundtables led to the adaptation of this Northern European version of donut economics and seeks to provide a, a place-based compass for change, seeking to ground all subsequent work in holistic rather than reductive approaches. It's just the first step of more to come and being a living prototype is a call for people of this place to adapt it and evolve it to better sense social needs and ecological thresholds. Working across scales is especially apparent in Coalition of Everyone's Regen Places Network, which developed with WWF Australia, acts as a living knowledge network. Uh, many of you might know already about this, um, but it completely supports a decentralized approach to place-based governance. On the other end of the, the scale, while still being place-based, the ABC Regen methodology on the right uh, is a deeply collaborative deliberative process um, for explorations of bioregional dynamics. And the engagement process looks to co-evolve understandings of the material, the biogeophysical and the cultural um, at the same time, which is in line with indigenous conceptions of nature, culture, interconnectedness. As I mentioned, um, both Regen Sydney and Coalition of Everyone are underpinned by a relational ethos and by principles of care and reciprocity. So it might initially seem that the imposition of economic limits based on social and ecological thresholds is ontologically incompatible with one of place source potential. But I, I think that they're actually both complementary. On the one hand, the development of de deficit-based imposition of limits, as well as strengths-based intersubjective approaches based on care and reciprocity. So with this framing, the dimensions of the Sydney donor you see here, looking to develop integrated sets of indicators to measure progress, they can be used to create detailed quantitative indicators to direct economic development, but they can also be used to build qualitative expressions of holistic inter and interconnected well-being. So I'll just wrap up with some final thoughts. I, I want to surface just a couple challenges uh, faced by myself and other systemic designers in this context of regenerative transitions, and then um, just wrap up with some final reflections. This seems particularly poignant at the moment. Um, globally entangled impacts. The quote you see there is from Amitav Ghosh from the Nutmeg's Curse. He says, the discussion of climate change, as of every other aspect of the planetary crisis, tends to be dominated by the question of capitalism and other economic issues. Geopolitics, empire, and questions of power figure in it far less. And that's glaringly evident at the, at the present. The concealment of those geopolitical concerns and empire can be seen in various examples, for example, uh, in the disregard for the carbon footprint and ecocide caused by military operations, prioritizing per capita metrics, and in the externalizing of social and ecological costs by multinational corporations who operate in a vacuum of deregulation. What's the role of design in the face of this? Perhaps it's to shift out of an out of sight, out of mind mindset, make what's invisible visible, and to address that concealment and um, obfuscation that's conducted by institutions to help to reveal systemic and institutional patterns of injustice, both local and global. Of course, organizations like Region Sydney and Coalition of Everyone have a limit to their agency. Their scope and potential impact doesn't immediately 
go to many of the concerns I've just talked about just then. But by broaching topics of global justice, attempts at agitation and advocacy can surely be made. As I mentioned earlier, funding is a serious challenge for, for regenerative initiatives. Uh, one of the emerging approaches to get systems change funded, known, of, known as systemic investing, Dominic Hofstetter from the TransCap Initiative talks about this as a multi-party and poly-capital approach, uh, looking to deploy diverse forms of capital. And you can see some of the organisations depicted there on the right working in the Australian context to develop systemic investing as a professional field of practice, to move beyond a reliance on solely philanthropic finance. There's a great synergy between systemic investing, systems innovation and systemic design practice, evident in their orientation towards navigating systems complexity through cross-sector cross -sector stakeholder alliances and across scales, um, as well as in their drive to identify leverage points and create coherence. So that's a call to further action. I've learned a lot about systems level design practice in my research and hopefully for myself built a clearer picture about the, um, the forms and potential of systemic design and transition design practice. Richard Buchanan's four orders of design that you see there frames the fourth order as pertaining to complex systems and environments. And the experiences of Regen Sydney and Coalition of Everyone have helped to uncover some of the, the elements there. In particular, this kind of design builds upon the multi-stakeholder engagement of service and strategic design with the convening of um, cross-sector alliances over longer time periods, which then again requires sustained capital investment. And some of the practices discussed today, prefiguration um, and so on are crucial here which help to elevate the, the fundamentally participatory and integrative nature of design practice. And like others, I found transition design as a, to be a subset of systemic design um, with a distinction that it, in its practices, there is an explicit ontological direction towards social and ecological justice in that approach. Uh, but, but of course, more needs to be surfaced um, through subsequent research. Um, and on that note, I'll just leave you with this slide. It's an absolute pleasure to continue on with Regen Sydney and Coalition of Everyone after I've completed this uh, PhD. It feels like just a small step in my journey. And with humility, I'd love to work with a lot of you here with us today. And in the spirit of collaboration, this is the image on the left is uh, one of Milen from Regen Sydney facilitating a, a gathering at Manly Beach. Um, and on the right, a quote, from Peter Senge shared by Alice, uh, uh, which captures the need to work on the ground and in partnership. Peter says, transforming systems is ultimately about transforming relationships amongst people who shape those systems. And that's it from me. Thanks. Great. Jazz hands, please, for Kieran. Great. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, I'll be posting this online for others to um, to learn and, and hear what you've been doing. Um, we have a few minutes. If anyone has any questions, I encourage you to pop them in the chat and um, Kieran can answer from there. So many cool cats in this room. Oh, hang on. Any comments? Anything? Yeah. Hey, uh, Kieran, can you hear me? Yep. I'm okay. actually just downstairs from Kieran at the Peach Palace. <laughs> so, um, I'm Kelly. Hey, um, that was amazing, and I loved your graphics, especially really beautiful artwork and way to present those complex ideas, um, in such an elegant way. Um. I want to ask you a little bit about, I know this is not a talk about degrowth, but I know that's a, a concept which has gone around a long time. Um, I guess from my perspective, I don't see growth per se as the problem so much as, you know, the, the limits on the earth 
systems that you um, alluded to, both of resource extraction and the ability of the earth to handle um, you know, the waste that we produce. And I wonder if like GDP is a very poor measure, but um, you know, and, and currently under our current system of measurement, you can cut down the native forest and turn it into toilet paper and create value because we don't value the forest. Um, so there's certainly ways to capture or, or measure the value of those natural systems which we um, which we use. But also, I guess the other the other issue with um, with trying to move away from GDP or trying to move away from growth is that it's so baked into many of our systems. Like for example, like if you uh, work for a company, then you are or you're a director of a company, then you're actually obliged to increase shareholder value. It's baked into all of our superannuation, our government, our borrowing. So it, it seems like moving away from that system might be almost impossible. And I wonder if there's a way to actually value and have, um, I know that's uh, it's easy to misuse those terms, but clean growth within that um, and actually as a way to transition more rapidly. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. I think um, when I think about the, the tensions with the concept of degrowth, I always go back to this healthy argument that was had between Kate Rayworth and George Os Callas, who's a degrowth author, Kate Rayworth being the originator of Donut Economics. And for her, the way she framed it is that you can have quantitative growth and qualitative growth. So as a human, um, Kate Rayworth talks about growing up and you increase in size until you reach maturity. And then after that point, you grow in quality, not quantity. So you're learning and growing in your experiences. And so I think there are different types of growth. And I think that goes to um, some confusion amongst the, the public when it comes to the word degrowth, because not all growth is bad, clearly. And that's not what degrowth activists are saying either. But there is room for confusion there. And I think in, so there's a difference between uh, the real kind of question there, I think, is when and how do you engage with degrowth? Who do you communicate using that terminology with? Um, I think there is value for, um, I suppose, uh, the, the kind of anti-framing that it has, it has a role to play. Um, and so it's a question around when and where that's valuable, I think. Um, donut economics, I think the framing being around thriving and having an aspirational uh, framework, I think strategically and tactically makes sense in global north context where no one wants to give up, um, uh, uh, you know, their kind of level of, prosperity. And so I think it's around finding um, forums in which each of those frameworks can be valuable. Yeah. I think there's one more in the chat um, from Sandra. Oh, there's a couple more. Yes. So, oh, sorry, yeah. I've got a few questions. Sorry. You wish, sorry. There's a few others since then, but we have a little bit of time. I'm not sure what you would okay. like to respond, Kieran, as you wish. Uh, I'll just have a squeeze through. Um, and, and of course, love to continue this chat with all of you outside of this, maybe through Regent Sydney of or Coalition of Everyone, depending on where your interest is. Um, Marsa, sorry, I'm kind of working backwards. That probably is a bit rude. Um, but yeah, Marsa is asking, examples of flying the donut. So Regent Sydney is working on that. There's a couple of programs of work uh, that we're um, just developing at the moment. Uh, one has just got funded with Waverley. And so that's at the neighbourhood scale. Um, generally speaking, it's not applicable. It can be, but it hasn't as much been applied in the private sector with specific businesses. Uh, way to convene rather in the commons uh, the public, diverse stakeholders from across public and private, but held in the commons. Um, but yeah, that's, and it can be applied in different scales. Um, I'm just going to flick over to Sandra's question. A concrete design initiative is made coherent with a larger movement. 
individual initiatives to the larger vision. No, it's yeah. So it's a. I think there's. I think you might be interested, um, Sander, in checking out Mariana Mazzucato's mission oriented um, innovation, which is very much top down and policy oriented. And then on the flip side, if you have a look at Dan Hill's designing missions and um, the Griffith Center for Systems Innovations Ch challenge led innovation, which are quite participatory and bottom up. It's a way to kind of frame the mission-oriented approach, um, but coming at it from a top-down uh, as opposed to um, a, a bottom-up way. So I think Dan Hill in particular, is, uh, very, he has a systemic design background and um, looks at it from a participatory approach. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much, Kieran. Um, Really great to have you. Thank you all for coming and take good care, everyone.